Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, good morning. I have the privilege to welcome you to the Latvian National Defense Academy. Last year we had our first academic conference to discuss the changing structures of power and security challenges in the 21st century. Russia was barely mentioned. One year passed very quickly, many things changed during this short period of time. And the most important is that worst pessimistic predictions suddenly have become reality. There is a war happening in Europe. Two years ago, Intel reports were telling us that Russia's military reform was behind schedule, that it would require decades, uh, that Russia is not capable to conduct large-scale conventional operations. During the last month, we could clearly observe well-planned and well-orchestrated Russian large-scale joint operations with extensive use of soft, strategic sea, air and land lift. We could see hundreds of armored vehicles, tanks, artillery and rocket systems on the ground, together with the employment of sophisticated intelligence assets. At the same time, some actors believe that the scale and intensity of information operations sponsored and conducted by Russia exceeds even anything experienced during the Cold War period. Russia's attitude shows that it is not only Ukraine at stake, it, it is ready to challenge the world order. That's why it is of extreme importance to understand what is happening both at the grand strategic and the operational level. For Latvia this year was marked by considerable changes in the attitude towards security and defense, both with our society and among our politicians. Moreover, our understanding about the importance of our essential values, democracy, unity of society, patriotism, solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have you today here with us in the National Defense Academy. Thank you for finding the time in your busy schedules for traveling to Latvia and taking part in this conference. I'm also glad to see so many members of National Forces here. Have a good and productive work and pleasant time. And before I give the floor to Janis Bezinch, Director of the Center for Strategic Research, there is a, I would like to make a short announcement. There is a donation box outside in the hall. The NDA is collecting donations for Christmas presents. These presents next week will be transported to Ukraine for the Ukrainian kids from military families that were displaced from their homes. We have printed out also some of the pictures and letters written by those kids uh, to Santa. And uh, I would like to encourage you uh, during the coffee break to take a look at them uh, and make your donations. And uh, I just want to remind that their fathers are fighting not only for their own freedom but also for ours. And thank you. And Yanni, the floor is yours. Good morning. It is really a pleasure to see so many people here. We started this, this our uh, academic conference, our annual academic conference last year. This is the seventh one, uh, and uh, we were on the small room there, smaller room there, and uh, now it's really amazing to see how many people uh, attend is, is, are attending here. Uh, the idea of the, the, the academic uh, conference, it, it is really, as the name says, an academic conference. So this is a forum for discussing ideas, not for making political statements. This is a place for uh, colleagues presenting research to each other, discussing research ideas and these sort of things. And, uh, and uh, so, pure academic event. You're very welcome to be here. I think, you, I hope very much you're going to find it interesting. Uh, we have a very, uh, 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 in my opinion, strong agenda. We have the best researchers on their fields here with us today. And uh, 
without any delay, I'm going to give the floor to our keynote, keynote speaker, Professor Mark Galliotti from New York University. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, Rector Yanni, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's good to be here, good to be speaking, even if it's quite a sort of depressing time to be considering Russia's role. What I'm going to be doing... What I'm going to be doing is talking for about 45 to 50 minutes. Um, then I'd very much like to throw the floor open to questions, but also discussion, um, because precisely this is an opportunity to talk about some of the issues concerned. Um, given precisely the, the, the quality of the panelists speaking, uh, what I'm going to be doing is really trying to sort of set the scene um, covering a, a wide range of issues. Um, and when I was sort of looking at the title, Russia and the Return of Geopolitics, well, one of the issues we can discuss is whether it's a, a return or whether it's something new. Um, what I want to do, though, is to talk a little bit about the, the sources of, of, of the Russian activity, the capabilities, the tactics, and then to try and look to the future and begin to actually get some sense of where we might be going. And a pretty central theme of actually how I look at what's going on at the moment um, is the arrival of what I call guerrilla geopolitics, which is rooted in a simple conundrum, a simple challenge. Russia has extremely ambitious goals for itself. Russia, in many ways, is trying to reshape not just its own neighborhood, not just Europe, but in many ways, the whole global security and geopolitical architecture. And yet, it's trying to do that as a relatively weak power. It has the memories of superpower status, but not the capacities. And what over time has evolved has been precisely this form of say, political asymmetric warfare. Um, so that, that's my basic thesis, that the Russia's current regime has come to realize that its aims can't either be accommodated fully through the present international order, nor be forced on that order by conventional methods. So it's built on time-honored practices to develop a new doctrine, one based on multiple ambiguous and parallel pressures, leveraging Russia's strengths and its rivals, i.e. our weaknesses. And really what I want to do is actually pick up on a variety of the, the phrases in, in that basic, I'll call it a thesis, it makes it sound much more scientific, um, that basic sort of perspective. Um, to, to start with the thing, I see Russia's current re regime, it's, it's very easy to fall back on assumptions about, well, the Russians are like that that they have some kind of imperialist DNA or whatever, and that's understandable, not in the least of the sort of czarist and Soviet experiences or whatever. But I think we have to be very clear about the extent to which what we're talking about is very much rooted in the current regime in the Kremlin. And even when we talk about that, it's important to stress that Putin today is not the same, in my opinion, as the Putin we saw during his first two presidential terms. So when we look at, shall I say, old Putin, we see someone who, of course, mobilized the rhetoric of nationalism very extensively and effectively, uh, and who clearly was a Russian nationalist. But nonetheless, he also saw Russia's future as being, to a considerable extent, dependent on its capacity to inter integrate with, on its own terms, integrate with the Western world, the outside world. He used the language of nationalism, but he never allowed it to constrain his policy options. He could basically turn it on and turn it off when, when it was needful. I think we see that nowadays, though, a rather different Putin. Um, one for whom nationalism is not just simply an instrument, but actually central to what he regards as his role in the Kremlin. This is a man who... And it's always dangerous to sort of 
I b believe his rhetoric sometimes, but I, I think my, my feeling is that this is a man who actually has come to believe his own language, come to believe that he has this essentially fundamental and indispensable role in saving Russia. Not just in holding it together. In some ways, his, his first two terms were about saving Russia from its internal fragmenting impulses after the terrible 1990s. Well, now it's saving Russia from external forces. Um, and that is obviously a, a much more sort of challenging issue. It's also, I would suggest, a view that is based on increasing ignorance about the outside world. Um, I spent the first seven and a half months of this year um, in Moscow. Um, and one of the things I was doing while I was there was precisely trying to get to talk to people who might actually have some kind of traction on Putin's own thinking. Um, and the fascinating thing was the extent to which people who I once would have expected to have had a role, who would have perhaps briefed him, or written papers that were meant for his inner circle or whatever, increasingly were saying, we have no idea. We do not know what Putin knows. We do not know what Putin thinks because we're doing the same as everyone else. All we get to do is watch television and, and listen to his speeches. Um, even people who are in the um, foreign ministry, even people who are within the general staff, clearly felt a growing alienation from the policy-making process. And again, I mean, this is just passing on what I heard, but, but someone I knew who had literally just a few weeks earlier retired from the general staff's main operations directorate. In other words, it's main planning and think tank element. Um, and I mean, he's someone I've, I've known for years, and he's someone who I plied with lots of alcohol, which is the, the researcher's best friend. Um, and he was saying that before the, the, the final decision was made about Crimea, they were already expecting a call to come and give a, a final briefing to the president or president's inner circle. They, they had their PowerPoints already and so forth. They were never called. Just the word came out, we're taking Crimea. So even people within the general staff are not now being brought into the discussions. Um, likewise, conversations I had with people in the foreign ministry made it very clear the extent to which they, they were just basically expected to just do what they're told. They were not involved in conversations. So I think this is the thing. We, we now have a Putin who, let's face it, is very, very rarely even in the Kremlin. He doesn't go into Moscow anymore, except when he really has to. He stays at his palatial dacha outside the city and summons people to talk to him when he wants. This is a man who has isolated himself from many of the people who, once upon a time, could tell him the hard truths, the kind of people who could say no to him. Now, OK, we expect that. Authoritarian leaders tend, over time, to retreat from people who are uncomfortable for them. And that's what we've seen with Putin. So I think this is a very definite, sort of a very worrying um, development that, that we have seen. And it's a Kremlin that's having to deal with new uncertainties, even before the, sort of the, the way things have sped up in 2014. Um, and particularly Putin himself is trying to come to terms. And, and here I'm, I'm wandering into the realms of amateur psychotherapy, for which I apologize. We cannot know what Putin thinks. We cannot know why Putin thinks what he thinks. We can just guess. So these are, treat them with caution, my guesses at some of the factors that are coming to, to bear. One is just simply issues of mortality. He's getting older. He's beginning to think much more about, well, what will his legacy be? And I think it's clear that he really wants to go down in history as one of the great Russian leaders. Um, and his changing sense of quite what that means is important. Uh, and I'll come on to the whole issues of quite what Putin wants for Russia um, later on. The economy, even before the current dip in oil prices and even before the new sanctions regime, I mean, it was clear that Russia's economy was heading for some problems. And that, again, is a fundamental political issue because so much of Putin's political legitimacy has been based on two social contracts. Um, a social contract with the Russian people, which says basically, look, you just stay out of politics. You let me run the country. 
and your quality of life will be better than it has ever been in your memories. And that's perfectly true. Um, Moscow is not a typical Russian city, but nonetheless, Moscow is a tremendously exciting and, and fun place now. Not a phrase I would ever have expected to have said in my life. Russians themselves, now in, well, until recently, have been living better than ever before. But that costs money. And perhaps most importantly, though, there's a second social contract, a social contract with the Russian elite, which is basically likewise. Look, you support and bolster the system, and you can live very good lives. Steal by all means. Steal up to the appropriate amount for your level. Um, and then spend it on your dachas and on your trips abroad and on everything else, with your luxury cars, you name it. Support the system and this will be preserved and protected. And again, that costs money. And so when the economy begins to go downhill, that puts serious pressure on the social contract. And so maybe you need to look for other ways of basically building the, the legitimacy of your regime. And that's another way in which nationalism crops up as a way of saying, well, okay, times are hard, but nonetheless, you must support the regime because we're doing something great for Russia. So he has to shore up his support within the masses, but perhaps most importantly, within the elite. And also geopolitical uncertainties. I mean, I think it's, it's clear that in fact, the world is shifting in ways that are not comfortable for Russia. The rise of China, however much at the moment Russia is trying to use China as a sort of a counterweight to the West, is also a deeply disquieting phenomenon for a Russian regime that sees that, in fact, China is a rival in Asia, that is worried about the extent to which Chinese money and Chinese migration might begin to be reshaping the Russian Far East. Um, so for all these reasons, the world in 2014, at the beginning of 2014, was beginning to look like a dangerous and worrying place for Putin. And Putin's natural instincts, in my opinion, are precisely to in those circumstances, to strike out. Not to just try and weather the storm, but to try and reshape the world around him. Which raises the question, okay, so, so what is it that he wants? Well, to an extent, it can be sort of brought down to this amorphous term of, of respect. It's clearly important for him that Russia is respected. There is this constant leitmotif, this theme that emerges of, of that sense that Russia is being treated badly, treated unfairly. And that also works for him. It was quite interesting, his um, early departure from the G20 summit in Australia. I think in part, that was a political move, but also it's in part because he genuinely felt that he was not being treated properly as the president of the great Russia. But far more importantly than all of these is this concept of sovereignty. Russian sovereignty, as Putin understands it, that I think is absolutely central to understanding what, what Russian policy is all about. His notion of sovereignty is basically one which means freedom, his own kind of freedom for his own kind of people. It's freedom to basically be able to rule Russia in peace. How dare the outside world feel that it can speak to Russia and tell Russia, tell the Kremlin how it can rule Russia? How dare the outside world seek to inf infringe on the capacity to, let's put it bluntly, um, oppress non-government organizations that give the wrong message? How dare the outside world try to tell Russia how it should protect intellectual property um, for software, for products, and so forth that, that, that are produced elsewhere? I think he very, very clearly has this sense that it is not anybody else's job to tell the Kremlin how to rule Russia. More generally, it's sovereignty of Russia to be able to do what he thinks is appropriate, which particularly means assert its control over its sphere of influence in Eurasia. The fact of the matter is that Russia believes that it has a historic and geostrategic right to intervene in countries such as Ukraine, such as Georgia. And they inevitably say, well, what about the American Monroe Doctrine? What about the West interfering in North Africa and the Middle East and so forth? And it has to be said that the West is not always entirely 
disinterested and moral in its actions. It's fine. But that doesn't actually explain away or rationalize what Russia has done, particularly in Ukraine. Um, but again, that, that doesn't matter. That's, a, that's precisely the kind of Western moralization that Putin wants to protect Russia from. And I think this is a point I'm going to be coming back to time and again. In Putin's mind, Putin is a defender of Russia. He is a defender of Russian interests. But he just feels that Russian interests nonetheless ought to have um, you know, a greater priority within Eurasia. And every time we turn around and say, well, no, actually, um, international law says that you can't just simply seize the Crimea, even if you've run some more than slightly um, bogus referendum in there. You can't just simply take it. Likewise, actually, no, Ukraine is a legitimate state with legitimate borders. Um, and therefore, what you're doing in eastern U Ukraine is actually a violation of that. Well, as far as he's concerned, that is not the West standing up for international law. That is the West interfering with Russian legitimate interests. Now, I should stress, I'm not in any way supporting those views, but I think it is really important to, to consider that. But it also means that actually Putin cannot accept half measures. It, it, it worries me in a way, because in some, it makes me feel as if I'm being particularly hawkish. Um, but the thing that strikes me is how little scope I feel there is for negotiation in the current status quo. This is not, I think, I mean, what, ha what is happening in Luhansk and Donetsk is not, in my opinion, because Putin wants to annex impoverished coal mining regions of Ukraine. Not at all is because he wants to use those as means of bringing pressure to bear upon Kiev. He wants to make Kiev bow to Russian interests. So, as it were, there is negotiation there, though the negotiation means essentially um, accepting Russia's demands. But more generally, his concept of sovereignty his refusal, in my opinion, to acknowledge the sovereignty of others when it possibly con conflicts with Russian interests. Um, these are not negotiable terms. He genuinely wants, in some ways, to take Russia out of the international order. I mean, I sometimes, slightly tongue-in-cheek, describe this as the North Koreanization of Russia. It's not that he wants to bring Russia out of the financial systems and so forth. I mean, he understands that Russia's prosperity depends on export of hydrocarbons, import of technologies, bringing in foreign credits and so forth. But even those he wants very much on his own terms. But, but basically, Putin wants to be able to determine Russia's relationship with the rest of the world in, and shape it in Russia's interests. And also, I mean, his character and domestic political considerations mean that there's actually very little scope for half measures, for negotiations. I honestly don't know how this will play out, except, and I'll come to this at the end, that I do think that Putin's actions in 2014 have ensured that Putin has doomed himself politically and have brought forward the end of his regime. But I'll, I'll come to that later. For example, there's really very little room in the status quo for his kind of Russia. NATO, which was undoubtedly um, in a situation in which it wasn't really sure what its future role would be, is now galvanized and now knows once again that its future role is the same as its past role. It is protecting the West against Russia, a different kind of threat, a different kind of Russia, but nonetheless that. Central Asia and the Caucasus are contested regions. I mean, these are areas that Russia regards as part of its sphere of influence, but in fact, these are also areas in which a variety of other powers are interested. And more to the point, the local nations, even while they may pay lip service to Moscow's desire to be the regional hegemon, the regional controller, are looking to basically leverage their position. If you look in Central Asia, um, you know, the, the Moscow-Beijing competition, sometimes Moscow-Beijing-Washington, um, is very striking. Um, the extent to which actually China is 
quietly in the way that China tends to, but nonetheless is, is looking increasingly to basically challenge Moscow's hegemony over the region. Likewise, if one looks at Central Asia, uh, sorry, the Caucasus, um, there's a variety of other actors. Um, when I was in Baku, I mean, it was quite striking to me the extent to which you found Turkish military and police advisors, Israelis, and others, as well as the, sort of the, the anticipated Westerners and Russians, all there trying to make their connections and so forth. And the Azeris gladly playing off one party against the other. These are not victims, these countries. They know they are in the shadow of Moscow, and they know that they have to somehow accommodate Moscow. But nonetheless, they are looking to see how they can maximize their own conditions. Moscow's grip over these countries is really quite, I would say, limited. Um, Moscow's ambitions entirely sort of collide with international law and a concept of sovereignty, and a whole variety of different institutions that they've been flouting of late. The European Court of Human Rights, for a long time, um, has been um, you know, identifying human rights abuses in Russia, um, obviously we particularly saw it with the war in Chechnya, um, and in turn being denounced by Moscow as, as an agent of, of foreign influence. Organizations such as the WTO, the World Trade Organization, or, or the G20 body. Um, the 1997 Russo-Ukrainian Treaty of Friendship. Again, its terms have been entirely violated by what's been going on in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. So time and time again, what Russia is doing is basically flouting international law and flouting the only standards that it itself had once upon a time sought to develop. I mean, Russia has had an interesting uh, relationship with, for example, the United Nations. That in many ways, Russia has actually been quite a, an effective member of the United Nations, and not just purely for self-interested purposes. But increasingly, it, seems, it sees the United Nations as, as a spoiler, as an organization it can use to flout other groups or whatever. But, as I said, although it has these grand aspirations, we have to appreciate just how limited a power Russia really is. You know, that is usually the, the sort of expectation, the understanding that you have. You know, poor little Obama is teddy bear against big bad action man of Vladimir Putin and, and his great big Russian bear. Well, I'm sure Moscow would thank you very much for having that perspective. Because really, I, I tend to think, I mean, <laughs> you know, hyenas and jackals, they're, 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 they're scary beasts. They have nasty snarls, but they're basically carrion eaters. They don't hunt. They will happily chew up whatever they can scavenge. And this, for me, I think, has been part of, and I slightly hesitate to use the words, but the brilliance of Russia's approach. I mean, I think strategically it's disastrous. Tactically, it has been, in many ways, brilliant. Um, they have managed to leverage their, what limited strengths they have to considerable advantage. But as I said, I think it's, it's important to stress just how limited those strengths are. I mean, this is, this is a sort of a, about the most optimistic projection I could find. And I'm stressed out, I, I specifically went for the most optimistic projection of Russian economic power. Because however much we might like to pretend that economics does not run, rule everything, the bottom line is that it does. Money is what feeds the sinews of war. Money is what keeps populations happy. Money is what allows states to assert authority over others. So at the moment, we see Russia is there, an economy between the size of Italy and Brazil. I mean, under other circumstances, could, could we ever see Brazil challenging and reshaping the world order? Would we ever actually describe ourselves, and with apologies to my, I'm half Italian myself, so to my, my compatriots, you know, are we really that worried by the Italian war machine? No, of course not. The point is obviously that, that Russia leverages a much greater proportion of its resources in certain ways and uses them in certain ways. But the bottom line is that Russia's economy is relatively weak. And even by this, this particularly optimistic projection um, that sees it sort of moving up the, the um, sort of chain, you know, still we're talking about something that is actually going to be between Brazil and Japan. Nothing like the economy of the, the European area, India, the United States, or China. This is a relatively poor country. 
which has massive demands. And I said, I mean, I, I'm personally, I'm not an economist, but so therefore, yeah, economists can, can bamboozle me with, 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 with their, their realities. But talking to economists who I, who I know, you know, most of them think this is much, much too uh, generous to Russia. So they haven't got and they won't have the money. What about their, their, their military capacity? Well, as we know, Russia has been spending a lot on rearmament under Putin, uh, far more in many ways than, than, than Russia should be. Um, they're not spending money on roads. They're not really spending money on education anymore. They're not spending money on health care. And let's face it, you know, a lot more Russians die from bad health care than could possibly die from the evil Nazis of Ukraine. Um, but that doesn't matter. Th this is a priority for, for kind of political and geostrategic reasons. Um, and, and Russia has been spending a lot. There you, there you are. It's, it's, it's third um, in, in that, that chain. But even so, I mean, it is much less than China, which is arming at a much more rapid and effective rate, let alone the, the gorilla in the room, which, is, which remains the United States. And what has that sustained defense spend bought? Well, as we saw in Crimea, um, it has bought soldiers who look modern and who seem to be able to sort of you know, organize themselves effectively, have proper tactical communications and uniforms that, that sort of have all the necessary bits of modern stuff from knee pads to eye protectors to ballistic helmets and such like. But we have to realize that what was deployed in Crimea was essentially the elite of the elite. These were Spetsnaz. These were naval infantry. What Russia really has now are two armies, I would suggest. It has built for itself quite an effective intervention force, and I'll come on to that later. Um, but the bulk of its military is still relatively underdeveloped. Its level of operational effectiveness is distinctly limited. It still suffers from the usual Russian scourges of hazing, bullying, Yidovshchina, um, indiscipline, certain degree of criminality, I mean, even according to the main military procurator. Something like 20 to 25% of procurement spend disappears. Well, money doesn't just disappear, money gets stolen. Um, there are still sort of massive challenges within the Russian military. So we shouldn't feel that, that what we saw in Crimea represents the new Russian military. It represents one of the two Russian militaries. So this is a force that has a, you know, a large rump that is still essentially in many ways, Soviet, despite the, the organizational changes that have taken place, and a smaller intervention force on which much more money has been lavished that has a much greater proportion of professional volunteer forces instead of conscripts. You've got to remember, Russian conscripts are, are, are serving one-year terms, which means that they're really sort of usable for maybe three or at most four months of the year. Um, and you know, likewise, all, all the shiny equipment has gone to these intervention elements. So what about the political limits to Russian power? Well, I think they're, they're, they're quite striking. Um, there is always this assumption that somehow Russians are different in that they're willing to accept whatever it takes in the name of Russian nationalism and Russian national pride. I mean, these are just sort of three statements that I've heard. You know, Russians will endure any hardship for the motherland. Um, the Russians are just simply brainwashed because of all the ludicrous propaganda that they see on television. And I have to say, from having gone through the brain-warping experience of watching Russian television in Russia for seven months, absolutely, I mean, there is this bizarre parallel world um, that exists only on Russian television. Um, and that Russians are more nationalist than anyone else. Well, I actually would question all of these things. First of all, Today's Russians are not the Stalingrad generation. Um, they have become used to a certain quality of life. Many, if not most of them, have traveled abroad. Even those who have not traveled abroad have, have, have a much, much greater sense of what life is like abroad. They watch foreign soap operas and movies. They have friends who have studied or traveled abroad. I mean, in many ways, one of the most corrosive long-term policies we ever can do against the Russian regime is to encourage student exchanges and foreign travel. 
the more they see what the West is like, um, the harder it is to mobilize them to support what Russia is now. Um, and we also have to realize the extent to which the, the sort of massive willingness to endure hardships during World War II was because they had Stalin's terror state behind them. Um, that actually, even if one looks at some, you know, and not for a minute trying to minimize the heroism of, for example, the defense of Leningrad, but nonetheless, one has to note the extent to which actually there was a massive political police repressive capacity there that was deployed to make sure that everyone fought on the barricades and so forth. Well, Russia today is authoritarian, but it is not a terrorist state. It cannot mobilize the same sort of level of fear to make people do things. Russians may watch the propaganda. They may well believe it on one level, but I think Russians are very used to being lied to by their state. Uh, they, they have been lied to, after all, for, for decades. They are able to, I think, detach and distinguish be, be, between the two. And I don't think they're more nationalist than anyone else. Again, I, th I think this is, this is part of the myth. Um, it's interesting that you know, Crimea was a special case. No one I met had a bad thing to say about taking Crimea. But if one looks at what's going on in eastern Ukraine, even while, you know, the opinion polls show this time and again, even while they, they, they believe that, that Kiev is bad and that poor Russian, ethnic Russians, Russian speakers were being exploited and, and put under threat in eastern Ukraine, it's still only a minority that would for a moment sanction military action there. It's only a minority that are willing to see their boys coming home in zinc boxes um, in order to preserve what, what, what's taking place in eastern Ukraine. There is not, in my opinion, a groundswell of public opinion for a prolonged conflict, let alone a military conflict, with the West or the outside world. And one has to think, well, okay, well who are their friends? I mean, China? We can look at the um, gas deal that was concluded with China. Putin needed that gas deal. The Chinese knew that full well, and they exploited that leverage to the fullest. The Chinese are not, regardless of what Putin would like to think, Russia's allies. Today, the Chinese are Russia's loan sharks, offering credits at the best terms they can possibly gouge, you know, to basically to exploit the Russians in their time of need. These are not long-term friends. Um, so who else have we got? Well, Iran. Again, the Iranians are happy to capitalize on Russia's willingness to, to sometimes support them or at least protect them, just simply as a way of getting at the United States. But it's hard to see there being any kind of long-term enthusiasm. Venezuela, well, good luck to you if you really want to rely on Venezuela as, as your great strategic ally. Syria, Belarus, I mean, come on, who are the Russians' friends? Who are the Russians' allies? <coughs> no one. Russia essentially does stand largely alone. So it doesn't even have what you might, we might think of as a sort of geopolitical muscle. So instead, it's turned to how it can leverage what capacities it does have. And on one level, this is, this is nothing new. I mean, it, one, one can track back um, Russia's activities and everything from the, the, the Mongol arts of war and espionage. And the Mongols, after all, were phenomenally capable um, in undermining the enemies that they were later on going to attack militarily. One can look at the, sort of the, 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 the Tsarist great game, the Tsarist Russia fought against fought this covert war um, against Imperial Britain in Central Asia, in Afghanistan, in Northern India. One can look at the Soviet active measures with which they tried to sort of destabilize regimes that were opposed to, to it and supportive of the West, the covert and proxy operations of the Cold War, modern information warfare. All of this is new. Sorry, it is, it is familiar. But what I would say is new is precisely the, the purposeful way that Russia has brought together all these tactics. I mean, if one looks at, for example, the sort of czarist tactics, these were typically ad hoc. These were carried out in a particular theater of operations because a particular local governor or proconsul had a smart idea and was happy to apply it. There was no grand doctrine of destabilizing regimes that were supportive of, of the British or whatever. Likewise, something that was different about Soviet active measures 
is, and this is something, I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll come to in, in a moment, is the extent to which actually the Soviets had an ideology. It was a self-serving ideology that was applied by a communist party that was largely made up of cynical careerists. But nonetheless, it was a genuine ideology. This is not the case now. Um, there is no real ideological basis to it. I mean, the Soviets would sometimes do things which were practically inefficient in the name of ideology. For example, in the Spanish Civil War, the extent to which actually they, they turned on and devoured their allies because their allies were politically suspect, rather than just thinking, look, our aim is to fight Franco's forces. and It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're on, on my side. Modern Russia is far, far more cynical and pragmatic than the Soviets ever were, and by God, that's saying quite a bit. So I think what's, what's different is actually precisely how to, today's Russia brings together a lot of existing ideas and disciplines and has a much more purposeful, thoughtful approach to it. And it very much, therefore, looks to thinking how it can basically um, you know, put those together. And these, I, I would suggest, are sort of a, 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 some of the key <coughs> sort of elements. Russia's great strength is breaking the rules. Rules that we feel bound by. Russia does not. Now, okay, in the long term, that's problematic because we begin to start thinking of Russia as a potential rogue state. But up to that point, it's actually very effective. The calibration of provocation. Um, again, this is something that is clearly tremendously current when we think of NATO and Article 5 and so forth. Um, the Russians are very clearly building a whole strategy on the basis of, well, how can one operate below, below the threshold that will trigger the kind of response that the Russians don't want? Classic example was in the Crimea, when you saw these Russians without insignia going out and, and seizing locations and, and blockading Ukrainian uh, military units. Now, they were patently Russian forces, even while Moscow said, oh, absolutely not, they're just people who buy their army surplus from local stores and people. Trust me, I. I actually looked around a whole bunch of, of, of Russian army surplus stores in Moscow, and I couldn't find Ratnik latest generation camouflage kit available. But the point is, it created this uncertainty in the West. Surely they wouldn't just be flat out lying to us. Surely there has to be some other potential explanation. Are these mercenaries? Is this some kind of unsanctioned operation being carried out by the Black Sea Fleet Command? rather than it's ordered by Moscow. Yeah. All kinds of different possibilities were being discussed. And that was crucial, because it gave Moscow the few hours it needed to essentially seize the salient locations within the Crimea, to basically make its, its annexation of the Crimea a done deal. Um, so in this respect, they calibrated the provocation. If it had just simply been the case of Russian troops openly rolling into Crimea, there would have been the chance that it would have first of all galvanized Kiev into fighting for, for the Crimea. And let's be honest, its decision not to fight for Crimea was disastrous. If it had fought for Crimea, it quite possibly would not be fighting currently in Donetsk and Luhansk. But that's a separate issue. But also, it meant that the West, at that key moment, was uncertain as to how to respond. And Moscow was therefore able to basically present the West with a fait accompli. The role of the security agencies, very important, the extent to which actually the intelligence and security apparatus is thoroughly and comprehensively integrated into Russia's way of war. They are not separate agencies. They are, they are absolutely sort of central to it. Um, the notion of, you have all arms active measures, by which I mean that you, you very much calibrate, or coordinate rather, military operations, intelligence operations, economic operations, propaganda operations, all of these together. Which again, is the Western ideal, but the West tends not actually yet to be very good at that. Well, I think the Russians have worked out how, how to do it much more effectively. Um, and, and we've seen this in what, what I mean, doesn't yet have a title, I called it the Gerasimov Doctrine. Um, last year, this, this very interesting article that, that emerged in what is not usually the most interesting of journals, the Monetary Economic Courier, um, in which, ostensibly talking about um, the Arab Spring operations, the chief of the general staff, General Gerasimov, who was one of the smartest and most thoughtful individuals, I would say, currently in the senior Russian military hierarchy, 
pointing out the extent to which in modern war, non-kinetic, non-military means can sometimes be much more effective than, than military means. Now, there are many military people in the audience, but my experience is that on the whole, people in uniform usually don't want to, to admit that their, their men and guns might not be the deciding factors. So I think it is quite, quite striking the extent to which actually this is, this is someone who is thinking of precisely of non-military means as part of a war-fighting strategy. And that is important. So what are Russia's strengths? Let me just very briefly sort of zip, zip through this. I mean, you know, there's a belief that it lacks a strength in, a, a stake in the status quo. It is willing to break the rules because it doesn't really think that the rules ultimately help it. Anything that destabilizes the current sort of international regimes, it thinks work to its advantage. It has intelligence power. This is one area that actually Russia does genuinely have, in my opinion, objective and relative strengths. Its intelligence apparatus, the SVR, the Foreign Intelligence Service, the GRU, military intelligence, and the FSB, the Federal Security Service, which is notionally domestic security, but in practice actually also operates internationally. Um, these have for years been ramping up the, the, the scale, the scope, the tempo of their operations. Um, they, they are a, a genuine Russian strength. Special operations and power projection, again, a, as we saw in Crimea. This is, this is that, sort of that, first, that first army, the good army. Um, there's the, the VDV, the, the, the paratroopers, four divisions and five brigades, the naval infantry, four brigades, three battalions, the Spetsnaz, special forces, eight brigades, a regiment, and so forth. I won't go through, through the full list. But I would mention that special operations center. Most Spetsnaz are not true special forces of the sort that we might think of as the United States Special Operations Command, the British SAS, or whatever. They're not tier one. Um, in part because, if nothing else, a fair number of them are still conscripts and so forth. They're more like, say, the French Foreign Legion. There are, they are an effective intervention force, a light infantry force. Um, but with the creation of the Special Operations Center, which, is, which has basically had its uh, baptism of fire in Crimea, um, the Russians have actually built a genuine tier one special forces capacity. Um, they have about 500 operators within it. Um, and, and, and this is this is something new. These are really the people with the skills and the finesse to be able to carry out the, the most complex operations. And then there are other sort of Spetsnaz groups. The FSB had anti-terrorist commandos. The SVR has a group called Zaslon and so forth. Um, it's, it, it's hard to really sort of pin some kind of a figure. But I, I would say we're talking about 120,000 um, deployable intervention forces um, that are pretty much close to solid Western standards. It's strength, it's, it's political. This is an authoritarian regime. Um, as you can see, this is, this is not a man who has to worry about, at the moment at least, public opinion. This is not a man who has to worry about what his, his legislature is going to say. This is not a man who has to worry about pressures on the budget until the pressures become far too great. Russia can control the message. This is still a, a country which has managed to reclaim control, particularly of television um, and, and the other airways. Um, and it uses its media in the rest of the world as an active disinformation, misinformation tool in order precisely to create division, create uncertainty in the West. To this end, it also acquires all kinds of strange bedfellows. Um, and again, this is, this is a reflection of the essential cynicism of, of Russian strategy. But whether it's Occupy Wall Street, um, whether it's figures such as Marie Le, Marie Le Pen in France, um, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany, um, even the ultra-conservative figure Pat Buchanan, who once point said that you know, Putin may be one of us because of his, his um, conservative social policies on issues such as abortion and so forth. They're very happy to encourage a whole variety of different agents. Anyone, really, who might help divide the West. Um, I mean, although clearly the, the overwhelming majority of environmentalists are just you know, genuine committed citizens, uh, there has been con fairly con conclusive evidence that Russian intelligence agencies have provided funding for, for environmentalists who are basically trying to campaign against fracking which is a sort of a strategy, after all, that would reduce Europe's dependence upon Russian energy supplies. Um, we have seen Russia advancing sort of a whole variety, or supporting a whole variety of right-wing anti-EU bodies 
and agencies such, such as you know, Jobbik in Hungary and such like. Um, again, not because it really believes in them or cares about them, but because anything to help divide the West. And our weaknesses are crucial advantages for the Russians. Our sense that we must follow the rules. The fact that we are divided. Um, the fact that also that Russia is not a priority. The West is very important for Russia. Russia is not always very important for the West. Now clearly, at this time and in this place, Russia looms heavily. But on the other hand, if you're in Washington, actually China, Ebola, um, the dysfunctions of the American political system, you know, all of these things are much, much more immediate and salient than what might be happening in Moscow. And Russia benefits from that, and the result is that we don't have a strategy. We don't really have tactics. We don't even have a mechanism for how to use the fact that we are economically, politically, militarily, in almost every single basis, we are stronger. We just don't know how to use that strength. And so this is, for me, the new geopolitics. It's not a Cold War. Um, it's not a time in which, actually, um, we need to worry about some grand competition for the world. This is practical rather than ideological. Putin does not want to convert the world in a way that the Soviets did. He does not care whether or not the British are Russian Orthodox. He does not care about what social policies the French have or whatever. He does not want to export Russian values. He wants, as he was regarded, to protect Russian values. This is an era of alternative warfighting tools, sanctions. You know, we, we must not pretend that sanctions are anything other than economic warfare. We are at war with Russia. We just happen to be at war or with economic tools that play to our strengths, which for me is a, is a plus. The aim is not to convert, but to neutralize the opponent, to, to prevent the other side from stopping you doing what you want to do. Um, and therefore, you know, I would suggest that we, we, we face a, you know, a future, and I think this is going to be for a while the new normal, which is about competition combined with grudging coexistence. We should not pretend that the Russians are our enemies in every respect. There is still cooperation taking place, and there can still be cooperation taking place. But the point is that, that competition will often over overtake that. Russia will be an insurgent power. Its key strength is not to basically force us to, to do things, but to create inconveniences that make us want to cut a deal with the Russians. That's how Russia is operating. It basically creates messes, creates trouble, and then turns along and says, you seem to be having some trouble. I could make that go away, but what, what's the deal that you're going to offer? And you know, we, see, we see that in, in all kinds of contexts. We saw that with Syria, um, that in many ways you know, Russia was, was, was very willing to basically support um, the regime in Damascus, not really because it had any great sympathy for the regime, but because precisely by supporting that, it gave the West a reason to basically try and buy it off. We've seen that with Iran. Again, no real love lost there, but it's more like saying, I mean, and, and from time to time, the West has given Moscow good deals, and Moscow has pulled back from its support for Iranian nuclear programs. It has pulled back from its commitment to sell the Iranians top-level surface-to-air missiles and so forth. But each time, it's that sense of the West, look, Make it worth my while, and I can make things more easy for you. The Arctic, in my opinion, is going to be another area in which actually already the Russians are building up the military capacity, um, not because they're going to occupy the Arctic, how do you occupy, occupy a shrinking ice cap, but instead to deny the Arctic and the opportunities for exploitation, for trade through it, and such like. And that's why Ukraine is so important, as a test, as a test case in precisely this business of just stirring up trouble and hoping that someone will make, make you a deal in order to change that. And to this end, actually, Russia does have, in my opinion, a defensive agenda. Now, it uses thoroughly offensive tactics in doing so. But basically, Putin wants to be left alone. Putin wants to be left alone. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Because the sorts of things that Putin demands are terms that would more or less write off huge portions of, the, of Eurasia to Russian influence, and would also involve us basically having to turn our backs on fundamental um, principles of international law. So this is, this is for me the, the future. That 
this, we can see at least for while Putin is around, this, you know, this kind of hot piece, this kind of guerrilla geopolitics as being the new normal. Even if Ukraine gets sorted out next month, which alas, it doesn't look likely, but even if that happens, that's fine. It will have addressed one specific issue. But it will not, in my opinion, change the fundamental um, divergence of, of, of interests between the West and Russia. Russia cannot beat the West. We're too strong. What we can do, though, is to fail. We can fail to constrain Russia. We can fail to prevent Russia from dividing us, from distracting us, from demoralizing us. But anyway, it, it, it's for us to lose. In the long term, I do believe that this strategy is going to doom Putin's regime. Um, I think that the, the crucial issue will be the economic one. Um, I think it will lead to increasing divisions and, and dismay within the Russian elite. And if I had to make a prediction, I would say the first kind of potential crisis point is going to be late 2016, um, after parliamentary elections, um, which, although they're going to massage the results, but nonetheless, if they go badly, that might have the elite thinking that it's time Putin has, has to go. But the point is, the end game is, is going to be potentially messy. Um, a Putin who feels assailed has very little interest and very little reason not to strike back, not to become increasingly problematic. I mean, if, for example, we continue to ratchet up sanctions, which is a policy that, that I would support personally, but nonetheless, and if it, that begins to have serious economic and thus political impact, Putin is going to be tempted to try and find other places where he can put pressure. And maybe that will mean stirring up Russian-speaking minorities in the Baltic. Maybe that will mean leaning on Moldova, now that Moldova is, is now looking much more clearly and directly towards the European Union. It, it will be essentially opportunistic. There is not, in my opinion, a grand strategy, but rather an opportunistic application of this new doctrine. But the thing is, in the short term, Putin will ratchet up the pressure. Uh, and if he does that, that will be uncomfortable, but that is actually a sign that we're winning. And so on that hopefully kind of positive note, um, I will stop for the moment. And as I said, I would very much like to throw this open to question, discussion, disagreement, or whatever. Or you're just thinking, where is our coffee? We were promised coffee after this person has so finished speaking. since it is an academic conference. You have all the right to anything. So. Yeah. Uh, Please identify yourselves. I will. Uh, uh, Tuomas Rostok's uh, Center for Security and Strategic uh, Research, National Defense Academy. Um, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to, um, oh, I wouldn't say challenge uh, one of your assumptions, but uh, uh, during your presentation, uh, presentation you mentioned that, uh, well, obviously today's Russia is not uh, Stalin's uh, Soviet Union, uh, but uh, there, uh, do you see a possibility uh, for uh, Putin's regime to, uh, conso uh, to consolidate its hold on Russian society even further? Because you, you, you mentioned that there is this social contract, but uh, Putin could also present uh, the uh, those who disagree with him with an opportunity, well, you're free to leave, and those who stay, those who have to accept even uh, further restrictions, even further brainwashing, they would have to accept economic hardship, there are possibilities to build uh, repressive organizations within Russia. Uh, so do, do you see this as a viable um, possibility? Thank you. Um, of course, we are seeing an, increasing, an increasingly repressive dimension to the Putin regime. We are seeing the regime become increasingly a mobilization regime. 
um, the emergence of sort of movements that are precisely to sort of try to whip up nationalist fervor and so forth. However, um, I think there are sharp limits to how far this, this can or will go. Um, Stalinism could only be created through the massive application of terror and more or less the shattering of Soviet society. Um, to do that in, in the modern world, I mean, I, I, I think it's not, not conceivable. And, and in fairness, um, I mean, Putin himself, I would not regard him as a nice man, nor do I see him as, as a sort of a, a blood bespattered totalitarian in the making. Um, if, in, in part because I think Putin's own self image is one that he, he likes the adulation. He likes that sense that, 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 that he is the, sort of the, the beloved and, and indispensable figure within Russian politics. I, I think that he lacks the, I'm glad to say this, the stomach for that kind of massive repression. And also, if one looks at the, the in, in instruments of, of repression, you know, we, we're talking about this is a regime which sacks journalists if they step out of line. It doesn't shoot them in the back of the head. This is a regime which um, you know, a few academics who maybe step out of line find trouble. But even then, there, there tends to be then protests about if people are, are, are sacked or whatever. It might not come to anywhere. Um, you know, we are talking about a regime that is still trying to pr preserve the facade of democracy. And, and an elite that, frankly, I don't think would be at all happy to accept true repression. Um, the interesting thing that I find, I'm talking, I, so I, I talk to people within the Federal Security Service, for example, and some I've known for some time. Now, these are, in my opinion, cynical and usually morally bankrupt individuals. They're usually corrupt and, and they have all kinds of deals on the side. But that's the whole point. They're, they're secret policemen to an extent, but they're just also just corrupt consumers. These, these are not the kind, this is not the Zhezhinskis of this world. These are not the people who actually are going to go out there and, and, and commit mass murder in the, in the name of that. So I think we are going to see an increasing authoritarian dimension, but I don't even think we're going to be, we're going to be hitting Central Asian levels, let alone Stalinist levels. Fortunately, that particular historical window for the moment is closed. And that counts as the, the best you're going to get for optimism from me probably today. Andre from the Ministry of Defense, you mentioned that we, we are strong, but we don't know how to use our strengths. Actually, I think it's a very painful remark, and, and, but uh, anyhow, perhaps you have some recommendations or your thoughts how we can use our strengths better than we're doing it. I think that in, in some ways, and again, this is there is no, unfortunately, sort of perfect mechanism, simply because that's the whole nature of democratic societies and democratic alliances. Um, the thing that has sort of bothered me, I think, more than anything else, has been the extent to which, um, when the sanctions regime began, uh, I was in Moscow, and I was talking to people, you know, from the foreign ministry or from GIMO, the foreign ministry's university, who are close to it, whatever, um, and, and others, and the extent to which they were all entirely of the belief that they didn't really have to worry for long. That the West would, 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 would say that they're shocked and dismayed and there'll be some sanctions, and then after six months, it will be forgotten. It'll be like Georgia. Um, and admittedly, now they're realizing that that's not actually the case. But, but this, this belief that the West is essentially the attention deficit disorder society, um, that we, we become fixated on one issue and then fixated on something else, I think is, is there is more than a little bit of truth there. And I think the key element here is to actually make, make it clear the extent to which the problem, the challenge, is not a specific battlefield. That this is not about Ukraine. Ukraine is the symptom of a wider issue. And therefore the issue is what do we do with Russia. Um, no one really is comfortable with words like regime change. But nonetheless, that actually is really what we're often thinking about. But the, the point is that, that there is not yet, I would say, within NATO or within the European Union, yet a sense that actually it needs to have a Russia policy. And that is the start. I don't expect that having a Russian policy will instantly solve the problem. But not having a Russian policy makes it almost impossible to solve the problem. 
So that, I think, would, would, would be my start point. And it's a very, kind of said, weak start point, but it is the necessary first step in building that. Because otherwise what happens is, not only does the, the issue become about Ukraine, but the issue becomes one about, as it were, frontline states against non-frontline states. Um, you know, try to convince people in London, less so, Paris, though, much more so, that actually what happens in Moscow matters, um, is, is an issue. And you, you don't want to have to be doing it time and time again whenever each new crisis emerges. You want to actually have a policy in place to deal with that. Yanis Kajetinsha, Latvian MOD. Can I pursue the uh, messy outcome a little bit more? Um, from the uh, Russian internal uh, perspective, if uh, the circle who are helping uh, Putin um, make decisions is becoming increasingly small and appears not to have any economists there at all, uh, this inevitably must mean that the scope for uh, starting to believe his own propaganda and miscalculation in particular uh, grows immensely. If we add to that the nuclear saber rattling, which is now uh, a regular uh, feature of Russian policy, then that all is very worrying. It wouldn't be worrying if we were uh, to be uh, still convinced that he is an entirely rational Czechist, as personally I think he is. Uh, nevertheless, these are worrying signs. And uh, if we look at information warfare, which of course you touched on, um, you said uh, that this is not the Stalingrad generation, um, and that is uh, patently so. The question really is, though, uh, is Putin deliberately trying to create a Stalingrad uh, generation by having this external enemy, uh, epitomized in particular by the United States, but NATO in a more general sense, um, and even if he's not doing it consciously, is this not something which might develop on its own accord and lead to increased xenophobia, internal problems in Russia, and certainly problems with its nearest neighbors? Uh, if we transfer this information warfare aspect outside the borders of uh, Russia, then uh, yes, of course you're right that Russia doesn't have a great deal of support um, outside, but from the China, China perspective, um, it's a lovely phrase that, uh, that China is, um, uh, 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 is Russia's loan shark, uh, and, but from the Chinese perspective, this is a wonderful opportunity to try to help uh, Russia stir things up and then use this opportunity while the United States is distracted to further China's own uh, agenda. Likewise, a lot of other countries actually like the what if of RT uh, and um, uh, staying united. On sanctions, we see that we are not united because we have a number of countries, uh, led in particular by Hungary uh, and Slovakia, which are opposed to sanctions. We have um, a high representative in the EU who's not at all convinced that uh, sanctions are right and whether her, what she says is what she really thinks. These are all uh, very worrying aspects. And in particular, uh, when you look at, you mentioned France, Marine Le Pen only two days ago on television said that um, Russia had been denigrated for 70 years, not 20, 70 years. Therefore, politicians in the West are picking this up, and what if ism is very, very popular. If this what, ism, uh, what if ism gets out of hand uh, and we start to fall apart and we see that a, a kind of alternative, uh, it's a pseudo-alternative, of course, of orthodox values, of tradition, conservative values, which uh, Putin supposedly espouses, comes up. Could this not all lead to uh, rather more than messy? Sorry to go on for so long. Okay, you've given me nearly a dozen different sort of um, points there to sort of respond to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Let me sort of wrap those together. Let, let's talk about messy outcomes, for, for first of all, in, in sort of sense of domestically. Um, in my opinion, the Russian elite, as the Soviet elite was, um, is tremendously self-interested and thoroughly ruthless. 
If I had to think as to how Putin will, will fall, it's not going to be because he's voted out of office. He wouldn't let that happen. Um, it's not going to be because there are going to be tanks on the lawn, necessarily. I think it's, it's going to be as happened for example with Khrushchev, which is more or less that the elite decides, this man has become problematic. Um, and, you know, he'll, he'll just be told, we've, we've chosen to accept your resignation on the grounds of ill health, or similar. Um, so, yeah, obviously, it takes time for that kind of elite consensus to, to, to form, and they're all whispering about it in, in, in the kitchens of dachas and things before anything actually happens. Um, but that also means that the elite themselves have an interest in not letting things go too far. I mean, for example, I am sort of relatively relaxed, as far as one can be, about Putin's rattling of nuclear sabers. Um, the nuclear option is just so, um, you know, can go so nightmarishly wrong. I, I don't actually think that there's any chance that that would happen. Even if Putin decided we're going to put a nuke in the field, or I don't know, Mariupol needs to be turned into a sheet of black glass or something like that. I think that's the point where you even have the Chief of the General Staff saying that, well, that's just not going to happen. Um, so you know, there, there are some things that, that, that we can rule out. There are constraints on, on, on Putin himself. Um, then there's also, as you were, the domestic constraints, the internal constraints, I should say, rather. Um, you know, as I, said, I, I don't believe that Putin wants to expand Russia's borders beyond, you know, maybe perhaps nibbling northern Kazakhstan. But essentially, this is a man who I think is a, a Russian civilizational imperialist. Um, I mean, this is why I, I don't think that he would want to invade the Baltic states. Put pressure on them, humble them, force them to do what Moscow wants, by all means. But for the sake of a few backsliding Russian speakers, as he would see them, who, are, you know, who have become willing to actually sort of haul themselves out for just, just for the privileges of democracy and a, a working economy, um, but to then also get Latvians and Estonians and Lithuanians, you know, troublesome people who, uh, who you then have to deal with. You know, I, I don't think he wants that any more than he wants to take over the Donetsk, because for every Russian-speaking Russian nationalist, you have Ukrainian, at, at least one Ukrainian and one Russian-speaking Ukrainian who doesn't really want to be part of Russia anyway. Um, so I mean, I think there, there are limits to what I mean. Really, just Putin just wants that kind of freedom of manoeuvre. So even if actually the West does, does begin to fragment, yes, it'll give Putin a lot more scope, but I don't think we'll, we'll be leading to sort of massive new nightmare scenarios. But in terms of what you're saying about the sort of the, the, the information of sort of warfare options, I, I, I don't think we're, we're going to be seeing sort of a Stalingrad generation emerging naturally or organically. Um, it's a thoroughly unscientific basis, but I mean, I think it, it came clear to me when I, when I was in Moscow that the best tool a researcher has beyond alcohol is, is to bring their dog with them. Because um, Mus Muscovites are not the most outgoing of folk. They don't sort of randomly chat to you in the street. But on the other hand, if you're walking your little dog, you are part of the global confraternity of dog owners. And just as our dogs are communicating, so too do we. And, and just talking to Russians of, of every stripe, from you know, shop workers up to chief executives, um, I, I was struck by how they can balance a political dislike of the West because of what they've been told with no sense of a personal animus, no sense of actually a desire that this is why we need to strike back against the West. It was all just, why is the West hassling us? Why is the West being beastly to us rather than the West? So I mean, I think you know, we're a long way away from even signs that there's any kind of general groundswell of true militant anti-Westernism in Russia. But the final point, though, I mean, I think you're, you're, it was a very sort of shrewdly observed one. I, think I agree with you. The extent to which actually, in some ways, Russia is the icebreaker for a whole variety of other revisionist powers that are really quite happy to see Russia mess with the United States. Um, bring into question elements of, in, of international law and such like. And certainly from the Chinese point of view, um, actually Russian actions are really quite useful from time to time, both because they, they distract the West, but also because they establish potential precedents for the future. Um, including theoretically the precedent of, well, given that there are an increasing number of Chinese speakers in, Russian, in the Russian Far East, how far Crimea will become an interesting precedent for that. But I don't think anyone in Moscow is really letting themselves think, think of that. But yes, I, th I think this is a problem. So long as Russia is able to act in the way it acts, 
it empowers and encourages a whole variety of other states, none of whom are going to put their own resources into saving Russia. I mean, so, I mean even the Chinese, they're, 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 not, they're not doing any favours to Russia. But on the other hand, but, but they are happy to see Russia doing its, its, its thing as long as they can. And this is another reason why we need to have a policy. We need to actually treat this as a serious point. Because even if Russia is not strong, China is. Um, and there are other countries that actually might well be much more sort of troublesome or problematic um, if it, it looks as if you can just get away with this kind of behavior. Holger Mulder, Estonia National Defense College. I think you correctly mentioned that West uh, didn't have a strategy towards Russia. But uh, what is the solution? Is there any ground for Western liberalism in uh, Russia? Or do you see, or we just have to wait a new enlightened uh, Tsar like Peter the Great or Mikhail Gorbachev? What are your implications? Thank you. I, I'm always um, sceptical about a, a solution that involves waiting for a different kind of czar. I mean, in some ways, the problem has always been that we've been happy with Russian czars at times, and unhappy with Russian czars, rather than thinking systemically. Um, in some ways, we have to accept the extent to which we are the victims of our own policy from the 1990s. Boris Yeltsin was one such czar. When Boris Yeltsin shelled his own parliament, in complete violation of the Russian constitution at the time, because it was a parliament that was a sort of a Soviet-era hangover, it was full of objectionable nationalists and communists and so forth, we said to Boris Yeltsin, that's fine, we back you. Boris Yeltsin, who, according to the existing constitution, had no longer become president, the point at which he went against the Supreme Soviet, just simply had the Constitution retrospectively rewritten, something that, again, was completely opposed to sort of basic democratic principles, but we said, ah, it's all right. You're the right kind of czar. We're, we're, we're going to turn a blind eye to it or whatever. Um, if we have a Western policy that is built around just waiting for the right czar, we can guarantee that we'll have five years, ten years in which things seem to be fine, and then one of the wrong kind of czars will come along. In the long term, um, you know, actually, it will be the democratization of Russia that really sort of begins to solve this issue. Not because every democracy loves every other democracy. Not even necessarily the democracies don't declare war on other democracies. That's possibly not entirely the case. Um, but just simply because, actually, then you will have checks and balances built into the system. Um, and, and therefore, what we need to do is precisely just, just understand that we're going to have to cope for two years, five years, ten years. We're dealing with a problematic Russia, um, a Russia that we're not very comfortable with, um, a Russia that will work through its own processes. I am actually quite optimistic about Russia's prospects as, as, a, as an evolving democracy. Um, you know, I, I think there are a lot of the ingredients there. Um, and even within the current elite, you know, if you look at the, the younger generation who are as, as cynical and materialist as you would expect, but nonetheless, they are far, far more exposed to Western norms than, than we might realize. Um, they are aware of the fact that, for example, that you know, property, property rights don't exist in Russia. They're aware of the fact that it's nice to be in the elite today, but you could be out of the elite tomorrow. And so forth. I mean, I, I, I think there is an awareness of the limitations of the current system. But that's where we need to be going. We certainly don't need to be going just for, just for a good czar, because a bad czar is always just around the corner. There's a guy here in the, in the red. Now, I, I'm, by the way, I should add, I am not the type to be here. When, when this session is, is done, someone has to stop me. <laughs> Hello, my name is Martin Swedins. I'm a blogger trying to cover the same uh, issues in my blog, also, by the way, on WordPress. Um, my question is uh, uh, a little bit uh, more specific. I would like to, uh, to hear your comments concerning uh, militarization of Arctic and what is the importance of Baltic region uh, in this process. 
and of course what uh, what what could happen what will be uh, russian reaction in the situation if uh, uh, finland and uh, sweden will join nato uh, eventually thank you well, first of all, the militarization of the Arctic. I mean, as I as I mentioned, I think it's fascinating the way that Russia is putting resources into building up its ice power. Um, you know, whole string of new naval installations, um, building new um, polar Spetsnaz units. By 2017, they meant to have stood up two Arctic warfare, you know, specialized Arctic warfare brigades. Um, and you know, we've also seen a stepping up of long-range air and sea patrols and such like, plus you know, the size of their, their icebreaker fleet is clearly sort of dramatic. Um, and in part, this is for legitimate reasons. They, they, they have their own interests and so forth, and one, one, one shouldn't um, deny that. But I think it is also that actually Russia has a much, much more expansive agenda. I mean, they have continued to make their case um, that sort of the, the extent of the Lomonosov Ridge is such that really they, they, they should, should have control over a much, much larger portion of the Arctic. Um, and I can't help but suspect that they're building up the forces precisely to, if need be, deny Arctic exploitation to, to other powers. Which again means confrontation. If, if they do follow that through, then that will come to the point where actually that, the Arctic will be an area of, of challenge. And I think that is, for me, one of the kind of concerning potential sort of spark points for, for the future. Um, of course, the interesting thing is that, I mean, that, that clearly has particular bearings if, if, if Finland or, or, or Sweden, um, and or Sweden, um, join NATO, um, which you know, is now looking, certainly particularly for, for Sweden, far more likely than it has at, at any earlier point. Because if they do, then not only does that actually very much shift the, the sort of the Schwerpunkt, the, sort of the, 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 the center of, of forces within the Baltic region, um, it also will actually mean that the, the, sort of the, the capacity for NATO to, to extend its own sort of resources in, into the Arctic becomes that much greater. Um, so again, I mean, I think that you know, what we're talking about here is Russia having a sort of a broad strategy, which is that it wants to you know, access the trade and resources, uh, hydrocarbon resources um, of the Arctic. It is building up capacities, which will essentially be precisely sort of denial. Well, I mean, I called it in a recent piece for the Moscow Times. I mean, extortion is really the sort of the focus of its uh, sort of um, policies there. I don't think it has a very, very specific operational notion of what, how it's going to use these. I think it just, it's building up the assets so that it, it has options once this becomes a, a sort of case. Um, and therefore, from that point of view, I think. If particularly, I mean, if, if Sweden or Finland really look as if they're likely to join NATO, I think that's a point where we'll see massive stepping up of Russian attempts to put pressure on these countries through um, political means, through economic means, through military means, um, which may well become entirely counterproductive. Um, but nonetheless, that, that, that will be, I think, the usual Russian response. So again, I mean, I, I think that, that we're going to see the high north and sort of the upper levels of Scandinavia becoming an increasing sort of conflict point in the future. My name is Ludas Danavichus. I'm uh, representing this Latvian Center for Strategic and Security Research. And uh, I would like to ask, uh, in, the, uh, in the last years, uh, and you already mentioned that uh, corruption is really making troubles for uh, Russian uh, both tactical and strategic plans, Abkhaz Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, the bridge to Crimea, I don't know, funds to the Novorossia, and uh, many other examples, and not to mention this uh, 700 billion Rubles, uh, military, military modernization plan. Uh, we always ask the question uh, what share of the funds will be stolen? So, uh, what do you think? What, what is the future tendency here if uh, the R Russian ruling elites uh, is planning somehow to tackle the problem of corruption, uh, which um, creates the problems from themselves already, and taking into consideration the problem of the shrinking pie, it could become even worse. Thank you. That's a really interesting one. Um, and I'm minded to remember, back when um, Putin was first campaigning for office, 1999 to 2000, 
there was this massive spike in capital flight from Russia, particularly criminal capital flight. Why? Well, because he talked very tough about the need to fight organized crime, and a lot of the gangsters thought he might mean it. Um, I remember speaking to one gangster in the sort of shades of the 1930s. He said he always had a, he had a suitcase, on, on, a packed suitcase under the bed. So that basically, if, if, if one of his contacts within the police was, would warn him, he'd just be grabbed that and be head, head for the airport. And then nothing happened. Um, in fact, it became clear that you know, Putin's priority was that organized crime must not challenge the state, which in part means peace on the streets. Um, but as long as it didn't you know, look as if it was undermining the state, organized crime could continue fine. Well, likewise, we, we often see with, with Putin talking about corruption. I mean, we've, we've seen the, the, the new anti-corruption plan that he's maybe talking about more um, this month's State of the Federation address. The problem is that this is a regime which is entirely built around corruption. That's the, that's the essence of the social contract. Um, there are all kinds of practical reasons why Putin might want to seriously combat corruption, not least as a way of you know, legitimizing the regime. Putin has often presented himself as the good czar who is on the side of the people against the evil boyars, who are the corrupt elite. Um, but to really fight corruption, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see some more cases and a few people being arrested. A, a genuine systemic fight against corruption will mean Putin basically declaring war on his own elite. And I don't think he has the capacity, but more to the point, I don't think he has the stomach for that. So I, I, I think it's highly unlikely that we're going to see any kind of sustained fight against corruption. And, in, in, and exactly, it's, that is going to exacerbate the economic problem because it's an invisible tax on every single Russian. I would also just want to throw in one other element. I mean, yes, corruption and criminality is a problem for the Kremlin, but it's also an opportunity. Um, you know, we, we, we saw that in Crimea, we, we see that in eastern Ukraine, that actually gangsters are often the Kremlin's best allies. Um, and we also see that in, in, in Europe and in North America, there are times in which actually we have seen connections between Russian-based organized crime and the Russian intelligence and security structures, you know, make, making deals and such like. So, I mean, unfortunately, I think we do. The, the, the criminal Kremlin connection is really quite a pervasive one, which I don't think is, is something that Putin's going to be addressing. So, right at the far end, I'm neglecting this side. Turn on the mic, please. Mm -hmm. uh, right, um, Edgar Ziv at uh, Parliamentary System of the European Parliament. Um, actually, I have two questions, and they're not related. The first one. Um, and actually, for both of them, I apologize, I, I was late, so perhaps you actually agree with them, and I didn't hear them. But uh, the first one is um, about uh, actually a relatively recent debate, uh, which started, uh, I believe, at the, one of the major um, foreign policy journals of foreign affairs, where I think it was the first article was one by John Mershimer, who said that basically it is the rest fault that the Ukraine that this whole crisis erupted because of the uh, sort of isolationist tactics and the expansion of NATO. And then there was sort of other articles as well backing that part of the up. Obviously, there were, as I said, it was a debate, so there were opposing views as well. But anyway, it just started, so it was interesting. So that's the first question, what do you think about that? And the other one, I was reading the other day at The Economist, um, uh, and the argument of the article was that Perhaps Putin doesn't really care about, um, you know, this uh, geopolitical expansion, and as you also said, perhaps doesn't have this grand strategy, but he cannot really give up the fight because the regime is so corrupt that they have to keep on fighting and be in the, like, there, there can be no regime change, otherwise they won't be able to access their own money, 
which they have stolen, and so basically they need to hold on to power so as to be able to actually have their money, and at the same time, obviously, they have no actually ways now to enjoy that money. So, so what do you think about that? Sir? Thank you. Just to start with the point about the tension of so it's, it's the West Hall type. I regard it as pretty fatuous and a bit of nonsense. Um, absolutely, there have been elements in which the West has not helped the situation. Um, the terms, I mean, let, let, let's be honest, the terms of the agreement with the EU that, that Ukraine signed or, or explicitly meant that Ukraine could not become part of Putin's Eurasian Economic Union. And the EU should have been aware that this was going to become a, a, a flashpoint and, and been ready for it in some ways. Um, but nonetheless, you know, when it comes down to it, Ukraine has the right to sign whatever deals it wants. Ukraine has sovereignty. And it's as simple as that. Um, and, and to sort of therefore say that somehow it's a sort of West fault for, for, for making Russia feel it had to invade one of its neighbours. No one has to do that. Um, in terms of, 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 of the issue of, sort of the elite enjoying their money and, and the, sort of the, the, the sort of wider questions of the, sort of the geopolitical struggle, I mean, on the one hand, the, the continuing geopolitical struggle does help Putin in the sense that it provides that enemy, it provides that sort of um, legitimating narrative of protecting Russia against these, these nasty outsiders. Um, but, but more generally, again, I mean, I think that from the point of view of the elite, um, it gets in the way. They precisely, they, what they really want these days, I would think, is basically Putinism without all this trouble. Frankly, 2013 for them was ideal. They could steal loads of money, the situation was relatively calm at home, and the West was happy to allow them to travel and to invest and to buy and to sell and to send their kids to private school and everything else. If I, again, just very much kind of provide a simple, you know, a, a symbol, symbolic in, individual example. There's someone I know who is an FSB officer who's clearly deeply corrupt. He certainly does, does not buy that late, late version Mercedes and his big dash outside Moscow on his FSB salary. Um, once upon a time, he was clearly a Putinist. He believed. To him, Putin was the man who was saving Russia. Last time I met him, um, it was the time of Putin's uh, presidential inauguration. I very much, very clearly got the sense that this is a man who had lost his emotional connection to Putin. Um, he is absolutely the kind of person who would not want to see regime change. He's exactly the kind of person that the tax authorities, the lustration committees, and everyone else would go after. But on the other hand, if someone else seemed to be able to offer the same, you know, basically security and a greater chance to be able to enjoy that long term, you know, if someone else could do the same things that Putin did, I think he'd weigh up the options. And I think that's the case with the Russian elite as a whole. That they are pragmatic Putin supporters, which means they're constantly making cost-benefit assessments. And if, in the longer term, Putin begins to look more like a liability than an asset, then it'll be in their interest to do something about it. So, I mean, I, I think that, yeah, they, they very much want to enjoy their, their resources. They need some kind of regime that is, shall we say, kleptocrat-friendly. Uh, or at least is willing to adopt a year zero approach that says, look, it doesn't matter how much you stole in the past, you just don't steal now. But you can enjoy what you, what you have now. Um, but that doesn't necessarily require Putin, and it just certainly doesn't require... Um, some kind of confrontation with the West. So, time? Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. That's all, all we have time for. My apologies to those of you who also had questions or observations. Um, and I look forward to now being in the audience and enjoying hearing other people's perspectives for the rest of the day. So, thank you very much, Professor Gaiwadi. I have just a short comment I just read this morning that uh, Russia's economy is about the Spanish economy right now, after all the sanctions and the oil prices and so on. So it is much, uh, in a much, let's say, worse state than myself, I could imagine. Uh, 
Also, a short point about the Arctic. I read on the Russian news that they have plans to deploy around uh, between 12 and 20,000 troops in the next two to three years there. So it is like a very interesting movement. Uh, but now I invite you to go to the coffee break, and uh, we're starting again at 10:30. Thank you.